Will it cannon? That is the question. Hello, Watchtower Database, and welcome back to another episode of Will It Cannon? I, I can never say that right. I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving, and we are definitely glad to be back after our month-long break. God, that was a long time. I'm sorry, man. I'm in a new kitchen now, but I still don't have a lab coat. This is your fault. God, I cannot see anything. Much better. Anywho, for those not familiar, in this show we'll be taking a look at a piece of DC Comics multimedia and determining whether or not it fits into continuity with Bruce Timm and Co.'s DC Animated Universe, which began in 1992 with Batman the Animated Series and essentially concluded in 2006 with Justice League Unlimited, existing throughout the 90s and early 2000s with other shows like Superman the Animated Series, Batman Beyond, Static Shock, I think that was it. Zeta. Project. No one cares about the Zeta Project. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the 2010 animated film Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. Oh my god, what the hell happened to this thing? This movie was originally written by Dwayne McDuffie as Justice League Worlds Collide, often inaccurately spelled with an apostrophe for some reason. It's not my collide, it's the Worlds Collide, you know what I'm saying, kids? And was meant to be a direct sequel to the Justice League animated series, bridging the gap between that show and Justice League. League Unlimited. But when the creative team was forced to try and make this movie and the first season of JLU at the same time, they were stretched too thin, as Bruce Timm put it, and they abandoned the project for another day. In fact, even a year later, Tim was quoted as saying that the movie was on indefinite hold, and its status remained a mystery throughout the remainder of JLU's run on Cartoon Network. Oh my god, this doesn't say DCAU on it. Oh, f I don't know what I'm doing. Is there a Sharpie in here? Hang on a second. God f***ing damn it. This is just pencils. There we go. Aha! <clears throat> this was not worth it. Four years after JLU's conclusion, we got Crisis on Two Earths. And boy, was it different than what we'd expected. By the time Justice League Crisis on Two Earths was finally produced, it was released as part of the DC Universe Animated Original Movies line, a mouthful of a franchise that had been mandated by Warner Brothers to be separate from any previous DC animated works. The studio wanted to distance itself from the Timverse in order to remain fresh, and thus had since produced such films as Justice League The New Frontier, Green Lantern First Flight, and most recently at the time, Superman Batman Public Enemies, among a handful of others, none of which took place in the same DC animated universe continuity we as fans had been exposed to for so long. Crisis on Two Earths itself was only released at all because Bruce Timm was tired of waiting for WB to greenlight another DCAU project, and he felt Dwayne McDuffie's script, or at least a slightly altered version of it, deserved to be given life. But while Crisis was presented in a new art style designed by Phil Barassa, who would later go on to design characters for Young Justice and the more recent New 52 style animated movie and featured a brand new voice cast rather than the all-familiar Conroy, Eisenberg, Lamar, and company, it still retained much of the DNA of the DCAU that had once been purposefully injected into it, including, but not limited to, the lineup of the Justice League missing Hawkgirl, the construction of a new higher-tech watchtower complete with teleporters and JLU-looking javelins, the inclusion of an expanded league roster, the origin of Wonder Woman's invisible jet, and reference to Flash having a car. What do you need a plane for anyway? You can fly. You drive a car. That is so not the point. These were all prominently featured aspects of the DCAU Justice League throughout their dual animated series. Well, okay, Flash had a car in one episode, but it happened, and were clearly elements of the original script left intact when the decision was made to produce this film as its own entity. The main Justice League members also more or less have the same costumes you'd expect from JL and JLU, but do these instances of semi-DCAU-ness alone give the movie a pass? Well, while there are still a lot of DCAU puzzle pieces left in this movie, there are also plenty of new additions or changes to the original concept that toss everything up in the air like a big bowl of Justice League salad. Wait, did I just make a salad tossing reference? For starters, we have the most obvious heresy, the replacement of Jon Stewart with Hal Jordan. Since Jon didn't have a very big part in the- uh, why do I do this? I'm sorry, Bruce Tim. 
Let me start over. Since John didn't have a very big part in the original script anyhow, it didn't impact the overall story in any important way. We'd just come off Starcrossed, remember, where he'd gotten some major FaceTime, so we felt it'd be good to let him take a bit of a breather. As we've touched briefly upon in past videos, Hal Jordan seemingly never became a Green Lantern in the main DCAU timeline. Sure, we see him swap with John due to hashtag temporal shenanigans in the Once and Future thing, but that was a short-lived one-time occurrence and it hadn't even happened yet by this point. Plus, the pure nature of that swap pretty much solidified the idea that Hal Jordan certainly may have become a Green Lantern in another timeline, but not the one we've been following throughout the DCAU. So even though having a Green Lantern on the team seemed essential enough to include for this movie, it's not Jon Stewart or even Kyle Rayner, so this alteration in particular definitely points to a this ain't the same universe, kids. Another big one is John Jones. While this version of his character could easily be the same as his DCAU counterpart, including the elements of loneliness that lead him to romance in this film, we're shown glimpses of his past when a Vulcan mind meld includes appearances by John's family, note the one child as opposed to the two we know he had via A Night of Shadows, and an appearance by the White Martians, who we know to not exist in their classic form anyway in Justice League. Rather, John's homeworld in that version of the DC Universe was ravaged by weird, squishy aliens of unknown origin led by the Imperium. I say again, these are not the Imperium. This guy is the Imperium. These guys are unnamed drone soldiers, weird, squishy, white alien things. Their official biography lists them as alien invaders. That's specific. But please stop calling these guys the Imperium. I swear to God, I will come to your house and ask you nicely to stop calling them the Imperium. I know this little Burger King comic said it, it got it wrong. It's not, it's not, stop. Plus, even if these guys were somehow the Imperium-led aliens, their spaceships are also pretty different looking, and we see Jean is brought to Earth accidentally, just like his usual comic book origin, rather than what he said in Secret Origins about how he came here to warn of the coming danger. There are other minor things here and there, like Superman being able to seemingly breathe in space without a spacesuit, or Starro's appearance despite not being a threat until the Batman Beyond era, or the Justice League's Earth containing alternate colors of kryptonite, or Aquaman having both of his hands. Looky looky, I got hooky. I just gotta say... <laughs> This one line is so funny. I crack up every time I hear it. Careful, Aquaman. They're stronger than you are. <laughs> it's also sort of implied that this is a mirror of the Justice League's world in many ways. You're from a parallel Earth. How could you possibly know that? Your internal organs are reversed. Your heart is on the wrong side. Yet the Syndicate's world has a Slade Wilson, a Marvel family of sorts, of which Superwoman is also a relative, apparently. When I was looking up characters for this movie, her name is Mary Batson? Like, okay, I didn't know that. And other doppelgangers of characters who, while may exist, we've never seen before in the DCAU. Plus, Black Lightning and Firestorm appear in the Justice League's world who we have no evidence of outside of their questionably canon JLU comic appearances. Yes, I know I keep saying those comics might not be canon. That's what this show is for, people. Just just be patient. But the other main problems with this movie's DCAU inclusion all have to do with, wouldn't you know it, this guy. It's Lex Flippin' Luthor. At the beginning of the film, when the Syndicate Universe's Luthor hops over to the League's world, everyone there initially assumes he's their own Lex Luthor and react to him as a frightening and menacing presence. However, were this movie to take place at its intended moment on the DCAU timeline between Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, the DCAU's Lex Luthor at this point has already been pardoned of his crimes and is a free man who has been giving some thought to politics. Now, sure, at this point, he's also led a group of supervillains against the Justice League, fought them several times on his own, and could certainly be easily traced to dozens of illegal activities through LexCorp. But if he's holding press conferences and working toward becoming a new man in the public eye, shouldn't these folks be a little less startled to see him out and about? And the location of the Justice League's world's Luthor in this movie? Oh, just prison. But even if that could be overlooked, remember this line from Justice League Unlimited's Question Authority? A is A. And no matter what reality he calls home, Luthor is Luthor. 
kind of undercuts that moment, yeah? On one hand, sure, with infinite universes and infinite possibilities, there's no way every single Lex Luthor is a criminal mastermind or even evil at all. Burn. But the question is convinced that at least the worlds of the Justice League and the Justice Lords are similar enough that it warrants the assumption that Lex Luthor will always be the villain, which simply isn't the case in this movie. Still, never met a Luthor I liked. So there's a bunch of ties to the DCAU and a bunch of stuff that knocks it out of the running. According to the producers, 95% of the script for Worlds Collide was left intact for Crisis on Two Earths. The storyline didn't change very much. The characters changed a bit, some of the motivations changed. Mostly what I did was cut out stuff that was intended to set up the mysterious new Justice League Unlimited show, which later enjoyed 39 episodes. But at the time we started, we were leading into JLU, so there was a lot of stuff that was supposed to erase questions. I took that out, but but I'd say 90 to 95% of it is the same story. And while it's arguable how much they really took out, the five-ish percent that was changed is worth noting and makes things difficult to decipher. On one hand, we get explanations for things like the teleporters or the invisible jet, which otherwise remain somewhat of a mystery in proper DCAU lore and do help to flesh out that already greatly expansive universe. On the other hand, writer Dwayne McDuffie has made mention over the years of changes to the script that drastically alter its continuity connections to the Timverse over his six years of revisions. Changes like the scrapping of appearances by Static and Icon, or the aforementioned swapping of Green Lanterns, or, interestingly, the relocation of Lex Luthor, who apparently was originally intended to be shown signing for his new book, Into the Light, which was brought up in the JLU episode, The Return. Your new book, Into the Light, certainly projects the image of a man who's reformed. When it all boils down, Justice League Crisis on Two Earths is a bizarre example of something that could have been. While it's a great movie on its own, and a fantastic entry in the line of DC Universe animated original movies say that ten times fast, I can never watch it without wondering what it might have been like with Jon Stewart, or Kevin Conroy's voice, or Bruce Timm's art style. McDuffie even stated the scene with Batman and other heroes fighting the Syndicate on the Watchtower was originally supposed to include only other heroes Batman had previously met on other animated series, Aquaman being the only one who appeared in both versions of the script, meaning I guess we'd have to assume Batman and Aquaman had some fun little aquatic romp off screen. That sounds worse than it was supposed to. But this means in the meant for DCAU version, we might have seen characters like Etrigan or Zatanna or Static, or the Creeper, Jack Ryder, or maybe even Nightwing. There he is, right there. But we will likely never see that version of the movie, and that makes James sad. You know, determining canonicity is a funny thing. There is no officially established set of rules in this arena. And while we can run circles around yes but this or no because that, what it really comes down to is a mix of the creator's intentions and how well we can balance it with the previously established DCAU. Think of it this way. When something is definitely canon, it's without a doubt. Mask of the Phantasm is part of Batman the Animated Series. Justice League takes plot cues from the Superman cartoon. There are no hoops to jump through, no problems to solve, really. Did you like that little thing I did? That was pretty cool, right? But things like, um, I don't know, Superman Brainiac Attacks, which we analyzed in our previous episode, leave a trail of breadcrumbs that keep you scratching your head and asking too many questions. The simple answer is, if you have to think too hard about it or try to force it, it's probably not canon. You can look at Crisis on Two Earths in a couple of ways, and it's unique because of this. Since it was originally intended to be part of the DCAU, things that stand out as odd can often be attempted to be explained. How Jordan could be present because the events of Starcrossed caused too much drama for Jon Stewart and he needed some time off. And in this case, he does exist as a GL. If they can spring Power Girl and Starfire on us, they can do anything. And no, I'm not going to get over that anytime soon. The art style could be different because the studio simply wanted to try something else, and we can look at it the same way we look at Batman's costume every time it changes or doesn't change, don't get me started. This same train of thought can explain Aquaman's costume, or the Imperium soldiers looking like white Martians, or everyone's voices sounding different. But that's the thing. You have to invent explanations. When something is canon, it just is. You don't have to explain things, at least not to that level. Sure, entries into DCAU canon like Batman and Harley Quinn, or various tie-in video games and comics, have some 
bewildering aspects to them, but it's often nothing that can't be worked around rather easily. Crisis, by comparison, takes a lot of work. Oh, it's time. Uh, the moment you've been waiting for is here. Will it cannon Justice League Crisis on Two Earths? I hope there's anthrax in here. have it, I guess. When you get right down to it, no. Crisis on Two Earths is not canon to the DCAU. But it was supposed to be, and if you squint your eyes and plug your ears, it's close enough that you could probably put it with your DCAU movies and shows if you wanted to. You know, just as long as you're prepared for the nerd police to kick down your door at 2 a.m. It's, it's me, I'm the nerd police. And in a way, we can kind of assume something very similar to this movie happened between JL and JLU, which just makes the DC Animated Universe's multiverse all the more perplexing. If you haven't seen this movie yourself, I highly recommend checking it out. I tried to keep important spoilers out of this video so that if you haven't seen it, you could still see it and like it. Go find it online somewhere or rent it from your local video store. Yes, those still exist. There's one in this town that I live in. I know exactly where their copy is. I used to work there. I labeled the shelf it sits on. This is too much information. You don't care about any of this. As for whether or not the DCAU continuity is dead or not, believe me, I very much appreciate that so many of you guys have so much love for the old series from BTAS through JLU. I do too. But frankly, I doubt that we'll be formally a officially doing another movie or TV series set in that continuity, but I suppose anything's possible. Thanks for watching, everybody. This video was voted into existence by you, the Patreon supporter. And if I pointed at you and you're not a Patreon supporter, then shame on your entire family. Just kidding. <laughs> But seriously, you can find our Patreon at the link in the description. We can't thank enough those who support us over there, and if you're not a member of the Patreon family yet, I highly recommend checking out all the cool rewards you can get. Voting for videos, automatic giveaway entries, I'll draw you a picture. I'm, I'm working on it, Issa, I promise. And be sure to subscribe here so you don't miss out on other upcoming DCAU content from the Watchtower database. And we'll see ya on the flippity. See ya on the other, see ya. Wouldn't want to be a, okay. Oh, he's going to miss the show and the sequel. What sequel?